What I'm going to be talking about today is, is regenerative therapy through the use of amniotic allograft or umbilical cord blood stem cell injections. Okay. I'm going to, throughout this, most likely answer all of the questions that you have about this topic. If I don't answer your question, at the end of all of this, I'll do a question and answer session. I'll take and answer all the questions you may have. Okay. So I do presentations on a lot of different topics. And by far, my favorite topic to do presentations on is the regenerative therapy. For the simple reason that the regenerative therapy is allowing us to provide answers to patients other than joint replacement surgery. And as we go through this, I'll talk about shoulder replacements, hip replacements, knee replacements, and essentially the, how unsuccessful they are. Anybody know what the success rate of a joint replacement is? About 60% success rate. And that's in the perfect population. That's in people that don't have any complicating factors. That's people that are not obese, that don't have diabetes, other complicating factors, which is pretty much nobody that has a joint replacement. Once those complications are added in, the successfulness of those surgeries go down. Not to mention the sheer fact that surgery is dangerous. Many complications <coughs> exist for surgery. And that hurt me because being a doctor, in the past, before we started doing the regenerative therapy, in the end, when we ran out of stuff to do, I had nothing left to do but send my patient to an orthopedic to potentially have surgery done. Knowing that it's not very successful, and there's a whole bunch of other things that go along with being in the operating room. And it hurt me because I honestly care about my patients. It's that drive and it's that desire to provide the patient with the best option possible is what started us looking into the regenerative therapy. And again, I'm gonna dive into this and I'm gonna talk about the specifics. I'm even gonna give you patient testimonials and show you pre and post x-rays about the regenerative therapy. Before I do, I sort of wanna talk to you about what our office is and what makes us different than other places. Because we have patients that come from, that have gone to two or three or four or five different offices and haven't got better. They come to us and they do. And it's pretty simple. And it's because we use a team approach that's results driven. Everybody that comes into our office has a goal. Everybody's goal is different. I have 70, 80, 90 year olds that come in with a walker. Their goal is to not have to use the walker anymore. Then I have 40 year old people that come in that they want to go out and they, they want to play volleyball or they want to run a marathon in a month. We take that into consideration. Not everybody is treated the same. We look at what the patient wants and we do everything possible to meet those goals and the results. And we do that through an integrated approach that involves a medical doctor, nurse practitioners, chiropractic, physical therapy, massage therapy, you name it. And the nice thing is we do it under one roof. That's important. The doctors that take care of you are always there. If we are open, we are there. We've all gone to a doctor before, maybe a primary care specialist, and we tell them that something hurts. They send us out to an orthopedic, the orthopedic sends us for physical therapy, and they send us another place for chiropractic, and all of a sudden we get lost. We get lost in the shuffle. Things we told one doctor doesn't go to the next, and it doesn't go to the next, and, and we lose that. In our office, we're all under one roof. We work together as a team to meet those patients' goals. We're goal-driven, and that's what's important. In addition to having all those therapies, we also have any kind of bracing, especially with arthritis of the knee. There are certain types of braces that can benefit people. We can do them in our office. You don't have to go to another place to do it. We can also do pharmacy in the office, too. I hate to make the analogy, but we're sort of like Walmart. <laughs> Everything's under one roof. Uh, it hits home, though. So when we talk about goals and results, it all comes down to this. It comes down to health. Now, I want you guys to ask yourself this question in your head. You don't have to answer it out loud, but is America healthy? No. We're not even close to being healthy, are we? We make up 5% of the world's population, but we spend more on healthcare than the rest of the world combined. And we consume 55% of the world's medication. And where has it got us? When we compare ourselves to other countries of the same first world classification, we rank almost last in every one of those categories. 
It's been termed the American healthcare crisis. Dr. Barbara Starfield, who works at John Hopkins University, identified these issues, and she published an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association back in 2000. And she came up with some pretty alarming numbers. She looked at people that went into the hospital, and just by going to the hospital, all the things combined equaled about the third leading cause of death in the United States for the year 2000. In the year 2000, approximately 225,000 people died just from going to the hospital. Okay? 106,000 died from the side effects of properly prescribed drugs. Properly prescribed drugs. Another 80,000 died of hospital-caused infections. Raise a hand. Who knows somebody that's gone into the hospital without an infection and came out with one? It's part of it. It's expected. They say with surgery, about 20% expectation rate of, of infection after surgery. I, the doctors do their best that they can, but it's going to happen. 80,000 people in the year 2000 died from infections. Another 20,000 died from hospital-induced errors. Another 12,000 from unnecessary surgeries. This is the one that I really don't get. What's an unnecessary surgery? Was that patient told that their surgery was unnecessary before they had it done? I, I'm still in the FDA able to figure that one out. This study came out 18 years ago. Another 7,000 died from medication errors. Okay? Me personally, I don't want to be any part of this unless I absolutely have to. And that's where the whole joint replacement and regenerative therapy thing comes into play. Regenerative therapy that we're doing in our office is literally keeping people out of the operating room. It's helping people avoid needing the replacement done. It's helping people avoid reading, needing the ligament reconstruction, things like that. It's doing it over and over again. I see it with patients. The results that we're getting with our individuals that have the regenerative therapy, it's amazing. And again, I'm gonna show you some examples of that. But again, if I can do my job by providing that patient with an option for regenerative therapy other than surgery, I'm happy because it keeps them out of here. Now, thankfully, doctors can do surgery, but it's not always necessary. And that's where I'm getting at with this. So, if that wasn't bad enough, it gets worse. There was a follow-up study that was done in 2016 in the British Journal of Medicine, and they showed that on average, that number goes up 25,000 people a year. So as of 2016, that number went up from 225,000 to 650,000. Unacceptable. And again, if I can do my job and get people better by keeping them from needing to have surgery, I take you out of this population of people. That's what we want. We simply want the best treatment possible with the least risk associated with it. Correct? Yeah. So, when we talk about our arthritis and when we talk about regenerative therapy, I'd say 90 plus percent of the people that we do the regenerative therapy with are individuals with arthritis. Without question, number one population. But it can also be used for minor ligament and other soft tissue tears. But the majority of the information I'm going to show you today is it's going to be based on arthritis because by far it makes up the, the greatest population of people that come into us. So arthritis is... It is a side effect, it's a process that happens because of excessive or abnormal stress that's placed on a joint. It results from injury, okay? Injury that might have happened when we were kids that causes damage to this cartilage here. Or it's a result of chronic abnormal stress placed on a joint. The guy that works for 12 hour shifts on a concrete floor, the mailman, the woman that works retail in high heel shoes, those are abnormal stresses that are placed on a joint that eventually lead to the breakdown of the cartilage. And that's essentially what arthritis is. It's a deterioration of the cartilage of those cushion structures that sit in between our bones. Who here has butchered a chicken before? When you break open like, like the, the leg and the, the knuckle and there's that shiny white stuff on the end of the bone, that's articular cartilage. They're making faces in the back. But that's what it is. That gives you an idea. That's cartilage. Cartilage. Cartilage is there so that when that joint moves, it does so with very little resistance. We don't want resistance. We want things to move nice and smoothly. And when we're young and we're healthy, it is. But guess what? That, that cartilage can be injured. And the problem with that, when compared to other structures in the body, cartilage doesn't have much bone, or excuse me, much blood going to it. 
very avascular. So once it's injured, your body has a very hard time healing it. As we get older and as these stresses continue, that cartilage continues to break down more and more until eventually we enter osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis goes in stages. Then at first, what happens is we, we will notice a decrease in the joint space. Following that, we develop cracks and fissures within the cartilage. The cartilage eventually tears and starts to wear down and our body starts to form bone spurs. <coughs> bone spurs is again a process of abnormal or excessive stress placed on a joint. It's usually somewhere in here between the mild and the moderate stage that a person starts to notice symptoms associated with that arthritis. They start with stiffness, reduced range of motion, difficulty moving, especially in the morning. We call it morning stiffness. Mm -hmm. It's a telltale, telltale characteristic of osteoarthritis. Until eventually we, we move into the severe category when our doctors tell us we're bone on bone. Who here has been told they're bone on bone? Yeah. You know what, maybe you are. But believe it or not, I've actually had patients come into our office, we do their x-rays, we look at it, and they're not bone on bone. That's, that's something that doctors use to scare you. And I hate to say that because I'm a doctor, so that puts me in that population of those other doctors. But it's a scare tactic. It's something doctors use to emphasize the severity of the arthritis. But again, bone on bone is a real thing, and that happens when, boom, that cartilage is gone, and that bone's sitting on another bone. And again, not to go back to the food analogy, but if any, if you know what a bone's like, right? You've had, everybody's had a dried bone in their hand. It's not smooth. It's quite porous, it's rough. <coughs> Imagine taking two of those and rubbing them together. Yeah, that's not fun. That, that, that causes a lot of inflammation. Inflammation triggers pain, all right? So, here are some x-rays here that show two different knees. These are two different individuals. This is a person's right knee. This is pretty much a normal knee. What we see is we see a nice space in between the bones. We see nice smooth bone margins, okay? We compare that to this one, and you can see the end, this, so this is the inside. The inside of this person's knee. Look at that, there's not much space left there, is there? No, that's pretty close to being bone on bone. And we can also see this little guy hanging off the end there, that's a bone spur. Oh, bone spurs, right? Horrible. So this person's probably experiencing pretty considerable pain, loss of range of motion, difficulty walking, hard time going up and down stairs, hard time transitioning from sit to stand, all those fun things that we have associated with osteoarthritis. Uh, look at this poor guy. Yeah. So this, is, so this is one individual, right knee, left knee. You can see that left knee's not good. That looks like that previous x-ray with the loss of the medial joint space. And I'll tell you what, when we talk about knees, 90 plus percent of the people that have arthritis, it's on the inside here, right there. Most of these x-rays I'm gonna show you are like that. Loss of joint space when compared to that lateral aspect, but look at this one. Look at that knee, look at that right knee. Yeah, loss of joint space laterally and medially. You can actually see, see how this, this is called the tibia, shin bone, tibia plateau. See how that one's flat? See how that one's downsloped? This guy's probably experiencing stress fractures in that tibial plateau. That's how bad this is. This is, this is normal. We see this kind of stuff. That guy probably can't stand full weight on that right leg. Uh, I'm showing you these because I'm going to show you real patient x-rays that are my patients down the road here, okay? <clears throat> so, th this is a question I want to just spit out whatever you think in your head. If something, if something hurts you, what's the first thing that most people do? If you have pain, what do you do first? Pain pill. Pain pill. Bam. Go to the medicine cabinet, right? <laughs> Joint pain, you grab an NSAID. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. I got no problem taking NSAIDs, short term ones. The problem is, I'll have people that come into my office, so like, yeah, I take ibuprofen for any pain. Like, okay, Joe, how long have you been taking it? Six years. How many do you take a day? Eight to twelve? That's not the way to use NSAIDs. I'll tell you right now. And I'll get into it here in a second why it's not. But eventually, those NSAIDs stop working. Same or increased pain. What do we do? We go to the doctor and they give us a prescription strength one, don't they? Okay, good, okay. That might work, that might work for a year, might work for six months, it might work for six weeks. But eventually that stops working too. 
So what they do is they take x-rays and then they usually do a cortisone injection, right? Same thing with cortisone. Cortisone is temporary. It might work for a year, the first time. Second time around, it might work for six weeks. Next time around, it works for a day. Temporary, temporary stuff. Then they memorize them and they usually do an arthroscopy. Again, short-term relief. Arthroscopies, they are actually going in usually and taking out that cartilage. <coughs> yeah, taking out the structure that's supposed to sit in between the bones, the cushion, the joint, and allow it to move through its range of motion without restriction. And they go in and cut it out. Doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, it's one of those things they don't tell us that ahead of time. And again, I'm not bashing what these doctors do, but what I'm getting at is that eventually all of this stuff, it's not a fix. It inevitably leads us to this, which is the joint replacement surgery. And as I told you guys before, 60% success rate, best case scenario, and you run the risk of putting yourself in that population of people that don't make it out of the hospital. This is why it always hurt me to send people in for that for the uh, replacement surgery, is that I knew what that person was in for. And it inevitably, everything was a delay, postponement of the inevitable joint replacement surgery. So, go to the NSAIDs here. <laughs> what the NSAID does is it shuts down the inflammation pathway. When we have pain, it's because of irritation that causes inflammation that triggers pain. If we shut that pathway down, it stops the pain. It doesn't fix anything there, does it? No, taking an aspirin, you know, the old chiropractic saying goes, you don't have a headache because of an aspirin deficiency, so why are you taking a headache, or taking an aspirin? Same thing goes with that, your, your knee doesn't hurt because you don't have enough, enough ibuprofen in your system. Um, so it reduces the inflammation, doesn't fix anything, doesn't address the actual issue, just addresses the symptom. <coughs> they don't regenerate anything, and it's associated with things like, like ulcers, uh, liver, kidney failure, and it's associated, just the NSAIDs by themselves, with 15,000 deaths a year. And people overuse them. Cortisone injections. So I have on here cortisone or HA. HA stands for hyaluronic acid. Some people call them gel shots. I have had a guy that actually called them chicken fat shots. Um, <laughs> we've all heard of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be straight up honest with you guys in the beginning here. We do both of these in our office. We do them. Because I'll tell you, right now, that cortisone, there is nothing that gets a patient's pain level down from a, we have people that come in, they're at an eight or a nine, a 10 out of 10 of their shoulder, their knee or their hip. The thing that gets them down fastest is a cortisone injection. Cortisone's a very powerful drug. It actually shuts down the immune system. The immune system is responsible for the inflammation process. So you shut down the immune system, you shut the inflammation, you, you turn the pain off, or at least decrease it. We do them, there's a time and a place for them. But the thing is, it doesn't fix anything. And in fact, when done multiple times in a joint, it actually speeds up the arthritis process. Most orthopedic physicians will tell you that a person, one joint, should never be exposed to two or three cortisone injections over the course of their life. Life, life. And I have patients that come in and get three or four done a year. Uh, not the right move. Temporary, it wears off, again, short term, and it really screws with people that have diabetes. But yet, they're done. The gel injections. So gel injection, or HA, hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is a natural component of the fluid that's usually in our joint, synovial fluid. Hyaluronic acid does a couple things. Number one, it's a lubricant. Number two, it sort of fills in the cracks and the crevices within the cartilage. It doesn't repair them, but it fills them in a little bit. It's essentially like oiling the joint, if you want to look at it that way. And what happens is that people that have arthritis, that joint doesn't have as much synovial fluid in it as it usually does. So what we can do is we can artificially supplement that joint with hyaluronic acid by doing an injection. Um, it works. Some people, the first time we do it, they get a year, a year and a half relief. Next time we do it, they get six months. Next time, three months. At some point, the hyaluronic acid injections, the gel injections, stop working. Because they don't fix anything. They delay the inevitable. Again, we use them both in our office, um, <coughs> but it, it, it doesn't do anything long term. Both by time before surgery. Ew. Everybody done eating? 
<laughs> Guess what you're gonna see? Pictures of surgery here. All right, so this is an arthroscopy. This is a clean out, okay? What you see here is a person's knee like this, looking at you just like that. You see a couple instruments going into the knee. Uh, that's them going in and you know, probably removing loose bits. They can grind off the bone spurs and stuff like that. But I'm gonna tell you right now, when it comes to patients that have an arthritic joint, whether it be a knee or shoulder, a hip, a wrist, an ankle, whatever it is, one of the things that we combat on a daily basis with that joint is scar tissue, okay? Scar tissue forms the same way that arthritis does when the soft tissue structures are exposed to excessive or abnormal stress. Scar tissue is the incomplete healing of the soft tissue structures, okay? That's why, think, think about getting out of, how you got out of bed this morning. Oh, I got up, you had to loosen yourself up and really stretch out. Think about what it was like when you were 20. You didn't have to do that. That is because of scar tissue. Scar tissue that's built up within the muscles, within the tendons, and even the ligaments. Very non-elastic. It decreases the contractibility, the flexibility of all the soft tissue structures. Scar tissue is something that we deal with on a daily basis. When they go in and they do these cleanouts, not only are they removing the cartilage that they're, that's supposed to be in between the joints, but they're actually creating all kinds of scar tissue. The scar tissue that we're already fighting, they're just making more of it. You know? So here is, gosh, I wish I could turn the lights off here. Hold on. Here's a little better. That's a knee. Again, you're looking at a knee like this. You got them sliced wide open. Okay, and you see two appliances here. They've already cut off the bottom of the, the thigh bone, slam this in, and they've cut off the top of the thigh bone and slam that in. Uh, you wonder why people get infections. That guy's knee's wide open, isn't it? And you can actually, so this is the kneecap over here. Remember when I was talking about that shiny white cartilage? See it right there? Yeah, that's what it's supposed to look like. You know what? Again, thank God in the past that we were able to do this kind of stuff. Because 60% of the people that get it done, they, they feel better afterwards. But, man, I don't want that done. <laughs> Me personally. Unless I absolutely, absolutely have to. Right? I mean, it, it, here's a shoulder. Uh, you're looking at the person, the, the lateral aspect of their arm. It's probably going to be their right arm here. You can see they've cut through and they've drilled into the ball and they're, gonna get, they're getting ready to pull that out. Um, look at the instruments. Again, scar tissue, scar tissue, scar tissue, scar tissue. Uh, these are things that could potentially, not for everybody, but potentially people that need joint replacements can't avoid that by getting the regenerative therapy done. You know, and it's even in the best surgical possibilities, things like this happen. These are pictures of my patients that have had infections after joint replacement. Now these patients came to me after the surgery, okay? It's, I didn't cause the infection, but we were treating them afterwards. And I can tell you right now, it only takes a day or two of an infection and a replaced joint to completely ruin it. I see it all the time. You know, and it, and it really breaks my heart because the people that come in after the joint replacement are people that are my parents' age, or they remind me of my grandparents. And to see them go through this is very, very difficult. Because once that infection is there, it ruins everything. I we started a patient three weeks ago uh, it's coming in with hip pain. He had had his other hip replaced. A year, a year later, he got an infection in that replaced hip. They had to cut out the entire appliance. They put a spacer and spacer got inf infected. That guy's leg, what he has left now, is all the way up here in his abdomen. He wears a shoe that has a sole built into it that's about that tall because that's how short that leg is compared to the other one. And again, you know, I see it on a daily basis with patients. I really do see it on a daily basis, is that orthos who do surgery send their patients, the problem patients, to our office for therapy, and we deal with this stuff. It's hard to see, and they never get better. I shouldn't say never, very rarely, after something like this happens. Here's a picture. Ah, this is a patient from a couple years ago, a young lady in her 50s. She had both knees done at the same time. Okay, she's, so you're looking, she's laying in the bathtub, her feet are up here, and her, the rest of her body's down here. That left one went pretty well, okay? Again, this was the patient that was sent in for rehab after the knee surgery. That left one went pretty well, look at that right one. She had an infection. 
Uh, she never, she never regained function of that right leg. Never. I, I believe the last that I heard she went and she had a revision done and it's, it's still not right. Yeah. Again, these, these things are potentially, for most people, avoidable. Uh, regenerative therapy is the way to go. Even if things go well, rehab following, sorry, went, went too far, rehab following a replacement is quite extensive. Um, on average, following, following a knee replacement, it's two months of post-surgical rehab. Following a hip, it's six weeks. Following the shoulder, it's two and a half to three months post-surgical rehab. After the surgery's done. Guess how much, on average, how much rehab insurance usually pays for? A month. Yeah, 10 visits. Yeah, he knows from experience you have a medical mutual policy. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's not much. So guess what happens? Guess who ends up being responsible for the rest of the therapy? You guys do. And it's even worse if you have Medicare. Straight Medicare has a $2,000 uh, therapy max for the year. $2,000. If you're doing in-office therapy, one therapy session usually reimburses about 200 bucks. So you're talking about 10 visits. God forbid you gotta have in-home in therapy and it's even, it's even less. You know, it's one of the things that's that insurance companies want you to do a certain thing, then you do it and they don't cover it. Well, they don't cover it completely. The other thing is the people that don't have money, that therapy that their insurance isn't paying for, they're not doing. And that's even worse. They went through all of this and they don't do the stuff afterwards that's necessary. Because a joint replacement without post-surgical therapy is pointless. Pointless, pointless, pointless. And it stinks. I take three people through it every day. Post-surgical therapy is not fun. Not fun whatsoever. So, what is this regenerative therapy that I've been talking about? In our office, it involves one of two things. Not a combination, it's one or the other. We use amniotic allograft injections, and we use umbilical cord blood stem cell injections. I'm gonna briefly go over each one of these with you. So, amniotic allograft injection and the umbilical cord st blood stem cell injection, first and foremost, FDA approved, okay? Both of these products, or these injections, are donated by healthy mothers during live birth C-sections. Healthy mothers during live birth C-sections. None of this stuff comes from dead babies. Got it? People ask me that at all, oh my God, Dr. Nick, you guys are doing stem cell injections, you know where that stuff comes from? Yeah, it comes from dead babies, no it doesn't. No it doesn't. To be frank with you, you, you can't buy fetal stem cells. <clears throat> Even if you could, we wouldn't, but you can't buy fetal stem cells. All this stuff, live birth C-sections, okay? It is an allograft, so you are getting somebody else's tissue. Because of that, it's processed in a clean room environment and it meets all the associated uh, tissue bank standards. The same standards that would be met if you were getting a kidney or a liver or a lung from somebody else, okay? And it's subjected to the United States Pharmacopeia testing. So again, this stuff is clean. It comes from mothers that are put through the ringer when it comes to health. They're treated for some, or they're tested for some 60 odd different genetic conditions. They go to the point where the women could not have lived in Europe between the years of 1996 and like 2002. Does anybody know why? Lindsay, you, no, you don't count. Did you? Man, cow disease. Yeah, that's how far they go with these women. So they, they go above and beyond to make sure that what you get, you did say man, cow, right? Yeah, okay, good. I, sometimes I hear, I'm old, sometimes I hear things. My wife says I do all the time. So it's, it's, it's clean, it's healthy tissue. So the amniotic allograph, okay, comes from the amniotic side of the placenta. So it's placental tissue and the amniotic fluid that's used, okay? And that's important, it does not come from the mother's side. The mother's side would contain antigens that would allow it to be rejected. But because it's on the baby's side, there's none of that. So the chance of rejection with either product is as close to zero as you can get in nature. Nothing in nature is ever 100%. But this stuff is as close to zero as possible. They have never, not in the testing, nor in any of the out of testing patients, the doctors putting them into patients, have they ever had a rejection from this stuff, okay? So what the amniotic allograft does is it contains what I like to call a regenerative soup. It contains growth factors, proteins, collagen, hyaluronic acid, 
and it also contains dead stem cells. Okay? When this is injected into a joint, it stimulates the repair of the structures inside of that joint that are injured. And the way it does that is by recruiting the body's own stem cells to the region. Okay? The amniotic, again, I'm going to repeat this because this is the big thing that separates the amniotic allograft from the stem cell injection. The amniotic allograft injection, when done, recruits the body's own stem cells to the injured area, whether that be a shoulder, a hip, a knee, an ankle, a wrist. Okay? So it regenerates, it rebuilds the cartilage, the synovial membrane, ligaments, tendons, capsule, bone, nerve that degenerate with arthritis. It actually regenerates things. It regrows those structures. It reverses arthritis. And in the case of ligament tear, for example, if that ligament tear is, is not complete, it will actually regrow those structures also. I know when I say that, it almost sounds too good to be true, but I'm gonna show you examples of patients, pre-X-rays, post-X-rays, and you will actually get to see the arthritis reversing itself. The umbilical cord blood stem cell injection, okay? Again, comes from live birth C-sections. They harvest the umbilical cord blood, and from that, they pull out what are called mesenchymal stem cells. Has anybody in here done research on stem cells, like on the internet or anything like that? No? Okay. Uh, the best, the best kind of stem cell is the MSC, or mesenchymal stem cell. The reason for that, it has the most diverse, it can replicate itself to the best extent, to the highest extent, and it is the highest quality. The only time we have mesenchymal stem cells in our body is right at birth, okay? Here's the thing about stem cells, and I'm gonna get into this here in a second. We have them in our body. The problem is, is that when we have an arthritic or degenerated joint, that body has a real hard time of healing that joint. That stem cells really can't do their job. If we didn't have stem cells in our body, they estimate that we would live somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. So the stem cells that we have in us have a really important job keeping us alive. And they have a hard time dealing with things like arthritis. But when, when you use a stem cell injection, it's a game changer. We provide that cell, we introduce it into that injured area, and it goes through and it actually regenerates the structures that we lose with osteoarthritis. And other kinds of arthritis too, specifically. So. A stem cell is essentially that primary basic cell from which we form. Some cells have two really important qualities. They can proliferate, they can turn into other stem cells, or they can differentiate. Differentiation means that the stem cell can turn into a muscle cell, skin, bone, tendon, cartilage, nerve, or other stem cells. The potential here is huge. And I'm going to tell you guys right now that we are on the verge of medicine changing. The use of stem cell and regenerative therapy injection from an orthopedic standpoint is literally just the tip of the iceberg. They're starting to use this for autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis, cystic fibrosis, MS, I already said that. Um, they're using this to even treat spinal cord injuries. In the next five to 10 years, things are gonna change big time. You know, we, we got in on this early and we're seeing the payoff and people getting better. This, you see the, the possibility for these stem cell injections. Heck, I, made, I met a woman uh, two seminars ago that actually had it injected into her eyeball to regrow her cornea. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not squeamish about injections, but an injection into your eyeball? <laughs> that, that just hits your soul, doesn't it? It's just like, oh, the eye. Um, but they're using it for everything. They're using it for, for everything now. And, and again, the utilization in an orthopedic setting Miraculous results we're seeing with patients. You know, and I, I also get a question, Dr. Nick, like, how long has this been used? And actually, the use of the amniotic membrane to treat injury goes back o over 100 years. There's a doctor named Maximilian Stern. He published an article in the Journal of American Medical Association back in 1913. He treated burn victims. He came up with the idea to use the, uh, the inside of the placenta, the amniotic membrane, 
to treat a burn victim and compared that to the use of skin grafts. And when he used the amniotic membrane, he showed that the patients, their healing rate increased two and a half times and they had almost zero chance of infection when compared to skin graft. Guess what they used, still use to treat burn victims? Skin, skin grafts. Again, this is something that boggles me about medicine here. Regenerative therapy that, that in an orthopedic like I'm talking about has been used in Europe for 25 to 30 years with great success. They've been used with your favorite professional athletes for at least five years. Peyton Manning, Tiger Woods, you name it. I mean, I can't say 100% that they've had it done, but if you follow any sports, the, the major injury in sports is the ACL tear. The ACL tear. In the past, it would take two, two and a half years for a football player to come back from an ACL tear. Now guys are coming back in eight or nine months. There's a woman that skied in the Olympics this past winter, tore her ACL in October and skied in December. That's not normal. They did something with her, other than just conservative therapy. I, I would bet a lot of money that it's regenerative therapy. This stuff works. In the past, even three or four years ago was not affordable to the normal patient. It just wasn't. People that could afford it were the football players, were for the Olympic athletes, but now it has become affordable. So what is, what is a regenerative therapy injection? What happens, like, do you, you know, is there an in office, you gotta be hospitalized, anesthesia? The answer is no to all of those, literally, if you have a regenerative therapy injection scheduled, you're in and out of the office within 15 minutes. In and out. The injection itself takes 15 seconds. What we do is we spend time with the patient first. We go in and if you're getting a knee or a hip done, we videotape you walking on a treadmill, we do range of motion testing, stuff like that, so we can measure your progress. The injection itself, no anesthesia, no hospital stay, no antibiotics. All those things, especially the anesthesia, ching, 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 it just racks up the money, doesn't it? If anybody's been in the hospital and had surgery done, or just been sick, you know how expensive it is. Insurance doesn't cover all that. You end up being responsible for it. And anesthesia, that's the number one thing that gets people. I have buddies that are anesthesiologists. You know, and they're, anesthesia, some people don't wake up. Plain and simple, they don't. Um, hospital say antibiotics. When you take, when you get the regenerative therapy injection, there's no need for an antibiotic. Uh, infection afterwards is as close to zero, again, as you can possibly get in nature. Zero recovery time. You walk in, you literally walk out. There's no downtime. There's no post-surgical therapy that goes along with it. True, there might be some therapy that needs to be done, but it's not the post-surgical type. There's not the pain and the other things that go along with it. No rejection, no adverse side effects. Clinically, they say to expect improvements in one to three months. I gotta tell you, off the top of my head, I can only think of one person that took a month to get better. Everybody else, we're talking weeks. It works, and it's so nice to see because I see these patients that come in barely able to walk, and then within a couple of weeks, they're doing things they haven't done in 10 years. It's really nice. One of the things that makes us different from other offices is our comprehensive approach to this, okay? We talked about the arthritis and that something caused it in the first place, right? Yeah. Guess what, when that person comes into our office, almost always, those issues are still there. Those biomechanical dysfunctions are still there that caused that stuff in the first place. We need to look at those things and correct them if the regenerative therapy is to be long-lasting, right? If you, don't, if you don't change the reason the arthritis came in the first place, why would you do an injection to reverse it if it's just gonna happen again? You gotta look at a person's body in entirety if you're going to give them long-lasting results, and that's what we do. We look at everything. We take all things into consideration. Medical massage therapy, chiropractic, we look at the person's posture. We do videos of you so we can see how you're standing and how you walk. <coughs> Excuse me. Active and physical therapy, even trigger point work, are things that may be involved in the patient's treatment in our office. And again, from a success rate, we've done over 100 joints. Only three people haven't responded. Three. So we're batting at 97 plus percent success rate with this. That's pretty good. 97 percent success rate with the with the regenerative therapy we do in our office. 
So I told you I'd give you guys a couple examples of patients that have had this done. Now I put this presentation together, oh gosh, at least a year ago, I think. So some of these, and I, I want to add, and I could add like 40 patients to this. But as we go through this, I'm gonna show you a couple. Uh, this lady was named was Colleen. And by, she's the only person that let me use their picture, by the way. Um, not bad looking girl. So she came into us, she was 54 years old. She's a physical therapist. She's a clinic director at an office really close to here. Debilitating knee pain that goes back to her 20s. When she was in her 20s, she was told that she was gonna need knee replacements by the time she was 40 or 50 years old. She went through all of it. I mean, she's a physical therapist. She did physical therapy, she did chiropractic, cortisone injections, gel injections, even the nutrition stuff, the glucosamine and chondroitin. Anybody here take that stuff? Yeah. Good, keep taking it. It, it works, it, it does good things, so don't get off of it. Yeah, right. yeah. You know, it eventually got to the point where this stuff wasn't working for her. And that's gonna be a theme as you go through this. I've done all this stuff, it's not working anymore, and they told me I need knee replacement. When she came in, her pain was so bad she couldn't sit crisscross. The big thing was like she couldn't wear high heel shoes. I guess that's a big deal for a woman. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I've never, never had that. Um, and that's a big deal because she'd go to all kinds of seminars and conferences, and she was the big wig of this this big physical therapy office, and she was wearing flats, and it really bothered her. Um, couldn't stoop down. Couldn't go grocery shopping. All those things. So she came to us in July of 2016. Here are her x-rays. You can see, especially on this left side, look at that loss of lateral joint space there. Yeah. Not, not good either on this, on this right side either. We did the regenerative therapy not too long after this x-ray was taken. And look at the post. Look at that lateral joint space compared to that one. Here, that's about 25% of the medial joint space. Here, it's about 50%. The only way that happens is if the cartilage regrows. Look at this knee. There's a marked difference between the medial and the lateral joint space. Look at that one, they're identical. These are camera tricks, these are x-rays. All these x-rays are x-rays taken outside of our office. In fact, we don't actually do x-rays in our office. Look at that. Considerable difference. The only way you see that difference are for those structures to regrow, specifically the cartilage. <coughs> this is Laura, 58 year old, she was a She's an ER nurse over at Mercy Hospital in Lorraine. Um, we're 25 years in the ER. Her two goals with, with uh, I almost said graduating, retiring, she wanted to play golf, she loved golf, and she wanted to be able to play with her grandkids. By the time she retired, she was not able to do either one of those because of her knee pain. This was a crippled, crippled 58-year-old woman. Did everything did rehab, did the physical therapy, did the gel injections, did the cortisone injections. Eventually they all stopped working. She came to us February 27, 2017. Yeah, that actually looks a lot like that other one, doesn't it? Just smushed down. Look at that alignment of these bones here. This one's not good. This one is pointing in a little bit. Look at that. That's because that's collapsing. The outside of her knees collapsing, and making it fold in. So we, again, we did the regenerative therapy injection real soon after this x-ray was done. She was doing so good, we only waited, what is that? Three months. Three months to redo them. Look at the difference. I, you know, it's same x-ray place, same setting, same position. Uh, it's there. What wasn't there is now there through one simple regenerative therapy injection. It's one injection, Tim, it's one, one. Never had anybody that's needed to repeat it. This is one of my, I got all kinds of favorite patients, but this one is probably my, one of my favorite, besides the last one that I'm gonna show you. Um, this is Ron, Ron came to us 45 years old, uh, he was an army ranger. I put former up there, but I've been told I should, once you're a ranger, you're always a ranger, so. Army ranger, debilitating knee pain, he estimates that he's had 50 plus deployments where he's jumped out of either a helicopter or uh, an airplane. Five right knee surgeries and six left knee surgeries. He was getting cortisone injections and gel shots done every three months for a year. And had done that for five years. 
excuse me, he's getting them done every three months, and he had done that for five years. That way exceeds like even the three times ever in a person's life, doesn't it? He's getting that, he's accomplished that in a year. Physical therapy, I mean, that's what the VA does for you, not to bash anything, but did physical therapy, rehab, gel shots, cortisone injections. He came to us and he said, I don't know if you can help me, but in one month, I am scheduled to have both my knees replaced at the same time. 45 year old guy. 45 year old guy. So, I, I, they both popped up at the same time. I need to fix that. But he came to us in April of 2017. For a 45 year old, that's a lot of arthritis. See that loss of medial joint space there? We did the regenerative therapy injection two months later. Look at that. It's back. This guy went from like a. And when, when you sit in front of a man that's an army ranger, he's been taught not to show emotion or pain. This guy literally sat in front of me and he broke down crying. That's how bad his knees hurt. By the time we took this x-ray, his, his pain was less than a two. It was only frequent. As of the last time I saw him, he hasn't been in a while because he's been doing so good. Last time I saw him, he lost over 60 pounds because he can get up and he can do stuff. He was, almost two, he was almost 270 when he came to us, and he's down around, around 210 or 212 last time I saw him. New man. New man. Next guy, uh, Howard, 69-year-old guy, farmer. He, he actually lives on the farm that he was born on, out in Henrietta Township. Uh, he came to us quite distressed. That, you know, he, he literally said, I'm going to lose the farm because he could not maintain the equipment that was necessary for the people that he leased out the property to, to do the farming. He had a chair that sat in between his house and his mailbox because he couldn't walk the 100 feet to his mailbox without having to sit down. Uh, he came in, and I'm gonna show you, the, he did the physical therapy, cortisone injections, he did all that stuff. This was another guy where they're like, you need knee replacement, and he said, no. I'm gonna go see what the regenerative therapy is all about. Here are his x-rays from June of 2017. Again, sort of looks like that other picture I showed you where it's, those bones are just ground into one another. Look how bow-legged he is. You see that? It's called the loss of medial joint space. He literally, when he came into my office, he walked like he just got off a horse. He walked like that. Pain levels, again, 10 plus pain levels. This, this guy, I could see it in his face. He wanted to be healthy. He wanted, his knees were just horrible. So we did that in June. Here is his x-rays from September. Look, see the space coming back in between his joints? Look at that. He's ground down, smashed bone on bone there. See it grown back? Over here too. Look how much straighter his legs are now too. You know, we did other stuff with this guy too. We put braces on him, we did a lot with him. But he was pain free within a month. Completely pain free from a 10 to a zero within a month and his pain has not come back. It, it, it's just, it, it makes me very happy to be able to see stuff like this on a daily basis with my patients. Um, here's the last one I'm going to show you. 40-year-old uh, athlete played football, did powerlifting, a bunch of <laughs> dumb stuff. Like all of us men do when we're younger, we do stuff we regret. We're told, don't do that, you're going to regret it as you get older. Do we listen? No, we do it anyway. This is what this guy did. Uh, five knee surgeries on the right side. ACL, PCL, MCL, medial meniscus replacements, not replacements, excuse me, repairs. Did physical therapy, did the nutrition, chiropractic, gel shots, cortisone, again, pretty much everything stopped working. Uh, from a functional standpoint, all this guy was able to do was walk. Couldn't jog, couldn't ride a bike even. Uh, show his x-rays here. Again, this, is, this was a 40, what was he, 41? 40, when this went on. Uh, February 2017. The joint space loss there for, for, for a person this, this old is quite considerable. You can see even when there is joint space, it's full of junk, okay? Bone spurs, these are staples and screws from ACL repairs. Uh, seven months later, look at that. Beautiful joint space. Um, let me introduce you to the patient. Do you look familiar? <laughs> it's actually me. Um, I've lost weight. You know why? Because I can get off my butt and actually do stuff now. Um, I'm probably, you know, I'm probably down 15 pounds. But, you know, it's one of those things that's, 
I saw what was going on with my patients. I'm like, I gotta be part of this. I would literally, by the end of the day, my knee would be this big around. It would be like a freaking softball. I would walk and it would just go out on me. Pop out, I'd go down in front of patients, grocery store, whatever. It would take me 20, 30 minutes just to get up. That's how bad my knee was. Um, I, I, I like to grow things. I love to garden, vegetables, flowers, stuff like that. I don't know, I just, I like to do it. Uh, so this x-ray was taken in, in, in February of 2017. The summer of 2016, I didn't even plant a garden. I know that doesn't, maybe it doesn't mean anything to you guys, but it's something I love to do. Love to landscape, I love to do that stuff. I couldn't, I couldn't stoop down to plant the plant, let alone do the stuff like the weeding and everything else. I didn't even do that. That's how bad my knee was. You want to know the, the worst thing about it? Anybody, you know you can go on Google and you can go on Google, Google Maps and you can do Street View? Yeah, you can go and actually like look at different perspectives. Guess what they did in 2016 when I didn't put a, any flowers or anything in? They drove past my house and did the freaking Google Street View. So if you go on there and look at my house, my, my yard looks horrible. I don't have any flowers. Anyway, it still bothers me. I actually look on Google and be like, man, drive down 93 and do that again, please. Um, but it, it's one of those deals, the, there's my bad picture again. Um, now, I haven't changed it for simply for that reason. I have, I have literally not have, pain, have any kind of pain in my knee um, a week after the injection. I can actually, and again, I know this doesn't mean anything to you guys, but I can take my, my leg and put it up to my butt. I hadn't been able to do that since the last surgery that I had in 1997. I'm doing things now that I haven't done in 10 or 15 years. And it was one injection. One injection. You know, and it's, again, it is changing people's lives in a very positive way. So, you know, everybody in their head like, oh my God, is this right for me? Can you do it on a neck? Can you do it on a back? Is it good for disc injury? Is it good for a knee, for an ankle? Da 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 da. I don't know. There are people that it's right for, and there are people that it's not right for. Uh, what I can tell you, the one thing that, one of the things that separates us from other offices that do the regenerative therapy is the decision as to whether or not to do it is made by an orthopedic physician. A lot of the other offices around here, it's a nurse practitioner, it's a physician assistant. You got an ortho that does that initial exam with you and comes up with the, the most appropriate treatment plan. When I say the most appropriate treatment plan, there may or may not involve the regenerative therapy. We're one of those offices where, in the end, what drives us is that patient getting better. We aren't owned by Cleveland Clinic or UH or Metro. <coughs> We don't have all these mouths to feed, and that's nice. And I say that because unfortunately, I see people that go into doctor's offices and they get things done that don't need to get done. We're not like that. You come into us for a consultation, which is this is what this is all about, and I'll let you know up front if we can help you. If we can, we move on in the process. But by being here at the seminar today, at the end of this, you're gonna get a chance with Sandra or with Lindsay to sign up for a free consult. Literally, you will sit down in a room with me, one-on-one, -on -one, and we'll talk about what's going on. You never get to do that with the doctor without getting charged for it. And I'm not gonna charge you for it, simply because we are busy. I only put patients in my office that we can get better. And I will be brutally honest with you up front, as well as Dr. Washi Diorthel, whether we can help you or not. If we can't, which is, the chance of that is small, if we can't help you, we'll get you to somebody that can. But I'm not gonna waste your time or your money, again, doing things with you that we can as close to 100% prove, or at least think are going to help you. Free consult. Take advantage, if you have questions, if we can help you or not, do it. Worst case scenario, it's a waste of 20 to 30 minutes of your life, you know? Plus, I'm not that bad to talk to, I guess. I mean, but, you know, it's one of those things, take advantage. So treatment options, you know, the regenerative therapy, that's what we're talking about today. That's just one of the options that we have available in the office, and we hit on some of this other stuff. You know, we can do the cortisone, we can do the gel shots, we can do trigger point work, physical therapy, medical massage therapy. We have some really good massage therapists in the office. Chiropractic, we do the bracing, pharmacy, the amniotic yallograph, stem cell injections, PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. We do that too for soft tissue injuries, okay? Like, like tendonitis, things like that. So what I'm gonna tell you, because this is one of the questions people always have for me, um, is regenerative therapy covered under insurance? 
The answer is no, okay? This stuff right here, not covered under insurance yet. Not yet. All this stuff is. In a minute here, I'm gonna tell you what the price is for the regenerative therapy. If it's not right for you, we might have other options, okay? And if it is right, if it's something that you're considering, we do payment plans, we do financing, all that stuff. So in the end, it, it's one of those things of one way or another, whether it be through insurance covered things, we can help you, or if it's regenerative therapy that we decide needs to be done, we can do that also. So again, surgery versus the regenerative therapy, we've gone over all this stuff. Very low risk, zero chance of infection. The big thing that motivates a lot of our patients is the cost. I'll tell you, these numbers are from 2016, so they're probably a little higher now. These numbers reflect prices for a knee replacement. Okay, in 2016, reimbursement, reimbursement for a knee replacement was between fifty-six and seventy-six thousand dollars. Okay, the out-of-pocket average for a person for their insurance that included the surgery and the rehab was somewhere between seven and fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, we all know how inflation works. The numbers are probably now closer to that number. So knee replacement, on average, everybody's insurance is different. I mean, there's hundreds of insurances that are out there. <coughs> on the average, a knee replacement is gonna cost somebody about, about 15 grand for a 60% chance of it working. And for a pretty damn good chance you dying, excuse my language. But it's one of those things like, you might not walk out of that. You might walk out and never be back to what even normal was before surgery. Again, this isn't me trying to scare you, it's the reality of the situation, and you're forking out that much money for it. On average, the cost of regenerative therapy across the nation is somewhere between $4,000 and $75,000. Out of pocket. In our office, here are our prices. The regenerative therapy for the amniotic allograft is $3,200 for a large joint. For the stem cell, it's $4,100 for a large joint. As multiple joints start getting done with the patient, the, the price goes down. So for example, if bilateral amnio is done at six grand, if bilateral stem cell is done at $7,000, it's because of the money we save on shipping. This stuff in both examples here comes frozen in dry ice and it's shipped overnight and all that stuff costs us a lot of money. And any time that we save money on something, we pass it down to you guys. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. What I asked you guys earlier, nobody's done their research about stem cell injections and costs and stuff like that. If you go out and compare our prices to the other places around here that do this, we're cheaper. And it's being done by an ortho. Not a nurse practitioner, not a physician assistant. In addition to that, We've done our research on this. We use the best products available. The MEO product that we use, top of the line. The stem cell product that we use is the only product on the market, this is important, only product on the market that's been tested by an independent, independent laboratory. No other stem cell product has been tested. All the research that those companies put out are done by their own labs. But what's the point of that? What it is, it's a federal crime for an independent laboratory to fudge any kind of testing. The, the, the product that we used when tested by that independent laboratory showed that it had at least a 55% viability rate of the stem cells once that product was thawed. That means the stem cell product that we use has live stem cells in it, okay? Nobody else can make that guarantee, and I say this with confidence, because I got the lab reports that I can give to you guys. I can email it to you if you want. So again, comparatively speaking, we use the best stuff done by an ortho. Um, we have really good success rate. So, when it comes to questions, um, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Yeah, go for it. Okay, yeah, you showed two different, the amniotic yeah. and also the stem cell. Yep. Does one patient get both those? No, do you, it's one or the other. How, how do you determine? That, that, and that's always the first question that I get, which one is right for the patient? Okay. And honestly, that's a conversation that needs to happen between you and the ortho who okay. does it. What I can tell you, here's, here's my input on this. Um, I personally had the amnio done because we've only been using the stem cell product for about four months now. The reason we didn't use a stem cell product before is that we didn't have a product that was tested by an independent laboratory. So asking, for us to ask a patient to pay more for a stem cell product that we couldn't guarantee contained live stem cells was pointless. The amniotic product has 
great results for patients. In fact, everybody that you've seen, yeah, all those uh, the x-rays that I showed you, the patient testimonials, those have all been amnio patients. Because again, we've only been using the stem cell for about four months now. But the potential, in my brain, the potential is there for that stem cell product to, to be a little bit better or, or even a lot better than the amnio. Because it has the live stem cells in your body. You don't rely on the body's own stem cells coming to the area, migrating to the area to, to fix the joint. The other question is, yeah. now the stem cell <coughs> that you use, is that compatible to everybody? It is compatible. Absolutely. Okay, there are none of the biomarkers. It doesn't have to be tissue matched. Okay, because uh, uh, my son is a cancer patient. They're contemplating stem cell, and he had to get a compatible donor. So, so anyway. what, what they did, those stems, so there are different kinds of stem cells, and the diff there's different ways you can get stem cells. Um, the stem cells that we use are mesenchymal stem cells that's pulled out of the umbilical cord blood. It comes from the baby's side of that system. It doesn't have any of the antigens that allow it to be rejected. Potentially, does your, does your son have leukemia? Some kind of bone cancer? Yeah, he has uh, like a Okay, so, sorry to ask, but that, that's, that's what we're going with here. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to put bone-specific stem cells into him that come from another adult. And because of that, they have to tissue match it. This is a this is a different scenario here. Um, there are also some people get stem cell injections that are autographed, meaning they actually drill into your own bone, pull the stem cells out of your own bone marrow, then inject them back into you. Very poor quality. Not mesenchymal stem cells. On average, the viability rate is five to seven percent, and it costs about double. There is a facility over on the east side of Cleveland, far east side of Cleveland, does the the bone, the bone pool of the stem cell, and the large joint is, I think, ten thousand dollars. Again, ours is forty-one hundred, and it's better quality. And you don't have to get your your bones drilled into. You know, ooh, which one do I pick? Um, pretty no, not a no-brainer. Other questions? Yeah, go for it. What restrictions are there after you have this done? I mean, can you, or is it even in your case, can you run? Can you jump? Can you do absolutely? Anything? So one of the one of the ways that the regenerative therapy works is that it works through the immune system, and inflammation is part of that, okay? We tell the patients when they come in and get the regenerative therapy injection, don't change anything. Continue <laughs> doing everything you did before the injection. Don't lay off, because we actually want to stress on that joint. We want the body's immune system to be triggered by that microtrauma that's caused by the activities of daily living, so then it, it then triggers those stem cells to fix that injury. So it's all about the innate intelligence. And that's the other thing people are asking, okay, if I put stem cells in my knee, why don't I grow an ear in my knee? The body knows what it's doing. It keeps us alive. It's pretty dang good at doing its job. It takes those stem cells and it uses it the way that it's supposed to. Plain and simple. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. Paul, you'll be second. Sorry. I have um, a friend who is, her MS has really gotten bad and She's kind of gotten, like I went to do her hair, and her leg locked up when she's trying to get out of the bed. And we have an awful time stretching it out. How bad is past when something like this could be um, looked at and said? Great. So great question. I'm going to address that with two answers here. Number one, the patients that have the best response to the regenerative therapy tends to be the older patient with horrible arthritis. Those people tend to get better really quick. I know I sort of did a poor job with the people that I showed you because everybody besides Howard was was pretty young. I gotta tell you, that's that's a that's a very small population. The majority of the people we do are 75 plus. So we've never seen a patient, and I don't think that patient exists, where the arthritis is too far gone. Okay? There are things that can exist in a person's joint, like what we call intra-articular loose bodies that would decrease the effectiveness of that regenerative therapy injection. But when it comes to arthritis itself, again, the patients that respond the best are the patients that are really, really bad and 70 plus years old. So when it, when it, when it comes to your friend, the constrictors and the loss of range of motion that she has in her joints isn't a result of arthritis. But the, but the MS. The MS causes constriction of a soft tissue structure that's neurological. It's it's not it's not at the, it's you know I, I wish I, I wish I could give you some hope to pass along to her. 
from our standpoint, the orthopedic use of regenerative therapy is not something that's going to help her. But there are studies out there, and I don't know what kind of MS your friend has. Certain kinds respond more favorably, but they're using systemic injections of stem cells with MS patients. There's a study going down at the Cleveland Clinic right now that they're doing that with patients. And they're showing hope with certain kinds of MS. I'm, I'm not nowhere near being a, an expert on that topic, so I can't go into further detail what kinds of response to. But if she's interested, I'd, I'd definitely tell you, have her contact them to see if there's anything they can do for her. Mm -hmm. Paul. Um, you had mentioned that that was a reflection of a large joint um, injection. What would uh, a smaller joint or? A sure, good, good question. So large joints are shoulder, wrist, hip, knee, ankle. Um, these could theoretically be done in the facet joints of the spine, not for disc herniations and disc loss, but for facet-based pain. And I can elaborate that on here in a second. Uh, it's about half for a smaller joint, like for a finger or a thumb or a knuckle or something like that, or a smaller carpal joint or tarsal joint in the foot. It's about half price. Yeah. Um, so another, people, another question that people always have is, Dr. Fabian, my back, you know, I have lower back pain or neck issues. Can it be used to address my pain? I don't know. About a 50-50 proposition. Because there are two parts of the spine that get arthritis. One is at the disc level. The disc is the soft tissue structure that sits in between the vertebra. That, through time, dehydrates, shrivels up, and turns into what we call degenerative disc disease. Right now, there's not a protocol involving regenerative therapy that can involve degenerative disc disease. There's just no way to keep it in place. There's not a capsule that surrounds that disc. But on the back side of the spine are joints. That's where, like how we can bend and twist and do all that. That motion happens at those joints. They're called the facet joints. There is a capsule around the, that joint. Regenerative therapy can be done to address pain or arthritis at the facet level. So to answer whether or not it can help a certain person with neck pain or back pain, only an examination can tell that. that that's with a lot of this stuff. You know, I'm, I'm up here telling you how good it works. I don't know if it's right for you. There's a huge process we go through. We vet people. If we suggest something again, it's with our understanding that it's going to help them. Other questions? I have, Shoot. I have a question. Um, does this allograft um, do anything with your sugar? None whatsoever. No. Nope. Doesn't affect it whatsoever. Yeah. No. Uh, no. 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 You, you mentioned quite a few times that only one injection. Yeah. Is there a possibility that you might need more than one? That's the possibility always exists. Are, are you talking years down the road? Or are you talking right off the bat? No, years down the road. Years down the road. You know, it all it all comes down to what I addressed earlier is that we gotta look at the person as a whole. We got to, as best as we can, make that person function as normally or optimally as possible. Because arthritis ca is caused by an injury or excessive load to that joint. That's why we always like to, and the regenerative therapy is always used and complement almost always with other stuff. We got to fix that person's bodily function. Granted, if somebody comes in and they're 75 years old and they've been in a walker or a wheelchair for two years, yeah, they're never going to walk normal. But getting them as close as possible to normal is needed to increase the longevity of these injections because this reverses arthritis, it doesn't prevent it. It reverses it, it doesn't prevent it. And that's the thing. You gotta do the right stuff that goes along with it to make sure that it lasts. So we've been doing it now for two years. Never had to have a person repeat it, never. Other questions? No? Are that good that there aren't any other questions? Come on, guys. And no? Huh? That one injection helps anything? No, no, it's very specific to the joint that it's injected in. Oh, okay. It's very specific to the joint. Joints are encapsulated. They have a capsule that surrounds them. That regenerative therapy injection, whether it be the amniotic or the stem cell injection, stays inside of that capsule and affects only that part of the body. This is not a systemic injection. God, I wish it worked that way. You know what I mean? Just inject and it fix everything in. Um, so when we go in for our, our consult, yeah. would you tell us which one we would better? That's not my job. Oh, it, it that, 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 yeah, that, is, that is the ortho's job. My job is to see 
if you are a candidate. Oh. I, I have questions. I, I, I know from experience and from doing this for a while what a patient needs and whether or not we can help them. What I answer is can we help the patient? It's not what needs to be done to help the patient. That can only come from an exam. And, and that determination of which one is answered by the ortho. Mm -hmm. and essentially, it's a conversation between the two of you as to which one you want to do. Yeah. How do you determine what was the cause of arthritis yeah, that's, in a it, person? Yeah, then, you know what, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. It comes down to one to two things. Excessive stress on a joint or abnormal. Abnormal is an injury. Car accident, football injury, falling off a ladder, doing something stupid. That's abnormal stress. That, that joint was exposed to stress that it could not, it could not handle. One traumatic acute event. Excessive stress is the example I gave of years of work doing one specific thing over and over and over and over again. So to, obviously we can't address, we can't, that one acute event, unfortunately we can't time travel, so we can't go back and fix that. But if we can address any of the side effect of it, I mean people come in all the time, and I always use the knee. People come in with knee pain, if it, if it exists long enough, it causes their back to hurt. It'll cause the other ankle to hurt, then it'll cause the other knee to hurt. And eventually they'll go into the ankle on the same foot and it'll spread into the hips too. Why? If somebody's knee hurts, they don't walk on it the right way and they stand on the other side. Stand on the other side to see immediately what my back does, kicks out. It's looking at stuff like that, easy, simple things like that. Address it, look at it all at once, fix the things that need to be fixed. And you maximize the result of the, uh, the regenerative therapy injection. Yeah. You know, uh <laughs> Before a lot of the surgeries that are performed on a person, the insurance companies insist that you try therapy first. That's correct. Now, what I'm wondering is, why doesn't the insurance companies insist that you do this before a total knee replacement? Is that political? It is political, 100%. Okay. The state of Arkansas, so there, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for this. The state of Arkansas forced, sued, essentially, Anthem, okay? Trying to force them into allowing people to get the regenerative therapy injections in an orthopedic setting, okay? And they won. Anthem now will pay for regenerative therapy in certain orthopedic conditions in the state of Arkansas only. What, what we're finding out though is the doctors that do the regenerative therapy in Arkansas, Anthem is denying the injections. There was a couple months in the beginning of 2018 where Anthem actually denied the, the hyaluronic acid injections until the, the patients threw such a fit they were going to drop them, they, they started allowing it again. That's here in Ohio. So, and so it's one of those things that five to seven years probably until it's used in an orthopedic setting across the United States, not, not being conservative on that probably. Uh, I, I, I don't, because it's a very long response, I mean it's, it's all about money. And it, well, I mean, look at this. To be honest with you, we make a couple hundred dollars off of one of these injections. That's how much the product costs us. A couple hundred bucks. You saw how much an ortho is reimbursed for a knee replacement. Fifty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars. Why in the world? And this is another question I get. Why are other orthos telling me that I need regenerative therapy? There's not much money in it. Simply not. You're not going to have three houses and four cars and by doing regenerative therapy injections. But guess what, it's the right thing to do with patients. <coughs> Plain and simple. Okay. And, you know, and, it's, and, and I agree, hopefully at some point in time, before you get a knee replacement done, just like right now, you gotta do the gel shots, you gotta do physical therapy, you have to do cortisone, you have to feel all those things before you get the replacement. Hopefully in the near future, it's, at the end of that, is regenerative therapy injection. It just, it's not set up that way now. Anything else? So yeah, now, one more. Now that this is available, yeah. would you advise anybody that's in the situation of possibly needing a knee or hip replacement to get a second opinion coming? Second you? opinion, third opinion, fourth opinion. Absolutely, 100%. You know, the, the, worst, the worst thing that can happen is, is you're told, yeah, it's not for you. You know? Cool. So any other questions you guys might have, come and ask me individually. Again, if, if you want to take the opportunity to, to go back and talk to, to Lindsay or Sandra and sign up for the, the consult, awesome. <laughs> Nice meeting all of you and uh, have a good Wednesday.